Philippians 3, 8 through 10 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your precious word. Let these wonderful words of life get down deep in our heart one more time. Help me as I preach from them, Lord. I pray that you let me say everything you want me to say, but not a single thing you don't. Magnify yourself tonight. These things I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Paul was a saved man, and yet he said, I want to know Christ. He was saying, I want to be close to the one who saved me. I want to understanding how he thinks, how he feels. I want to be able to anticipate what he expects. The heart cry of every child of God, the passion of our life, the goal of our days ought to be to know Jesus Christ better and better every single day that goes by. And if we're going to know him, we're going to have to study his life and his word because the world says a lot about him, but most of what they say bears no resemblance to biblical reality whatsoever. So we've been studying through his life for over six years now. Uh, the series is titled, Getting to Know the Real Jesus. We're coming to an end of it. We're in the last day or so of his life. This is part 136 of our series. This message is furnished and prepared. Go to Matthew chapter 26, please. I'm going to read you three parallel passages. One in Matthew, one in Mark, one in Luke, all covering the beginning of the same event. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26 verse 17 through 19 the Bible says now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover and he said go into the city to such a man and say unto him the master saith my time is at hand I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover now go to Mark chapter 14, if you would please. Mark chapter 14, the next passage that describes the same thing, and this is the one we will look at most of the time during this message. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. The Bible says, In the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare, that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good men of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared there make ready for us and his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he'd said unto them and they made ready the Passover now go to Luke chapter 22 verse 7 for the last of our text passages tonight Luke chapter 22 verse 7 through 13 Luke 22 7 the Bible says then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed and he sent Peter and John saying go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat and they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he'd said unto them, And they made ready the Passover. One of the world's most famous, well-known paintings is The Last Supper. It was painted from 1495 to 1498 by Leonardo da Vinci. Measures roughly 23 feet by 29 feet. It adorns a wall at the end of the dining hall at the monastery of Santa Maria del Grazia in Milan, Italy. It ostensibly shows Jesus and his 12 apostles during the moments of the Last Supper when Jesus informed them that one of them would betray him. But while da Vinci's artwork was unparalleled, there was so much more artwork in the reality of that night and the event, so many more brush strokes that the gospel writers recorded for us with quill and ink rather than with brush and paint. And the divine tapestry of that night started well before Christ and the twelve entered into the room. God himself was, as he so often does, using the divine brush strokes of his own hand to paint undertones and contrasts and vibrant details to produce a masterpiece 
peace that could only come from the unfathomable wisdom and ability of the Ancient of Days. So I want to look carefully at the preparation for the Last Supper and see what there is to see about Christ within it all. Notice, first of all, in Mark 14, 12, the station of Jesus. Mark 14, 12 says, And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? Now, as we get a little bit farther down into the text, we're obviously going to go back into the past and look at the Old Testament and see what the Passover was and show what it was pointing to as Christ was preparing for it. But before we even get there, there's an immediate matter that presents itself to us in this text, something that once again shows us the humble and pure heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we dare not gloss over it. Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God and God the Son, the second member of the Trinity. He's the God who in eternity past stepped out on nothing because there was nowhere to step, spoke to nothing because there was nothing to speak to, and had the nothing that was not there to hear, hear anyway, and become something in the nowhere that was now somewhere just because he said so. That's the Jesus we serve. Jesus Christ was the one whom Isaiah saw and heard the angels over him saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And yet this very same Jesus was the one who laid aside the glory and splendor of heaven, robed himself in flesh in a virgin womb, and came to earth on our behalf. It would seem that in so doing, he who made it all, deserves it all, and infinitely more, would, ex would expect to be availed of the privileges of his position and get everything he needs and everything he wants when he needs it and when he wants it. And yet as he, the King of kings and Lord of lords, was making his way to Calvary to suffer and die for us, he only had one last meal to eat, the most important meal of the year for every Jewish person, the most important meal of his life individually, and as he made his way toward that meal, his disciples had to come to him and say, where do you want us to prepare this meal to eat? Now do you understand the practical significance of that? Jesus did not own so much as an inch of property or the smallest of homes anywhere on this earth. He who made it all and was Lord over all of it did not own any of it as he walked on it. He lowered himself in his own words to have nowhere to even lay his head as he walked among men. In John chapter 2, he was able to legitimately call the glorious temple in Jerusalem my father's house, and yet on this earth, there was not so much as the smallest hut he could call his own house. Man, what a stark contrast the real Jesus was and is to the grotesque caricature painted of him by the heretical prosperity pimps of the day. If you listen to the Hens and Osteens and Ferdicks and Whites and Dollars and Copelands, you'll come to believe that Jesus was a Rolex-wearing, Bentley-driving, mansion-dwelling mogul and that if you have enough faith, you'll be the same way because that's what God expects of all of us. But the station that Jesus chose for himself in this world was humility rather than honor, sacrifice rather than superstardom and having to ask for a room to have one last meal in just before he died. So we see the station of Jesus. Notice number two, the symbolism of the past and the substance of the present. Now there are some things that both the writers and early readers of the gospel accounts understood when it came to what you're reading that some people today do not understand because they weren't there and didn't grow up in the culture. Well, they're integral to everything that takes on. So let me give you a few moments, please, if you'll give me a few moments, rather, to explain them to you at this point. The Passover went back some 1,500 years to the time of Moses. Most everyone knows to go over to the book of Exodus when you're trying to find out about that. Most everyone knows that the first Passover was when God sent the destroyer through Egypt that night and every house that didn't have the blood on the door experienced the devastating loss of the firstborn. That event is what gained Israel her freedom for 400 years of bondage in Egypt. And for all the years after that, every time that day of the year rolled around, by legal decree from God himself, they commemorated that event by killing a lamb, shedding its blood, burning part of it before the Lord, and eating the rest of it. There was an entire meal of bitter herbs and unleavened bread that went with it, but the lamb was the really important part of all of it. In fact, it was so important that it had to be examined for a couple of weeks ahead of time to make sure it was absolutely spotless, a perfect sacrifice. Well, as the centuries went on, the nation grew. 
By the time of Christ, the week of the year that Passover was in, had millions of people in and around Jerusalem for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that followed it. Lambs had been examined and approved by the priests and were available for purchase in and around the temple. Luke tells us that Jesus sent Peter and John to prepare, and that would have included more than just finding a place. It also would have included securing the lamb if it had not been done yet or bringing the lamb back to the temple to sacrifice it if they would already secured it within the day or so before. So as Peter and John found themselves in the temple that day, they would either have been there on what we would call the first, second, or third shift. In other words, there were three specific times during the day that the people could gather into the temple for their part of the sacrifice. That way, not everybody was there all at once crushing into the temple, and there was room for the sacrifices to be handled. Since they were from out of town and wouldn't have had the ability to make provisions ahead of time, they almost surely were in that first group of worshipers to come to the temple. When they arrived that day, they would have found all 24 courses of the priests present on the job. Nobody got off work that day. There was too much to be done. Lines would form, and one after the other, in line after line, the lamb would be slain and its blood captured in a golden bowl. That bowl was then passed to a priest, and then he passed it to another one, then he passed it to another one, all the way to the altar, and the blood was shed on the altar. Then the portions of the lamb that were designated to be burned as a sacrifice of the Lord would be so dedicated and burned on the altar. At that point, the remaining portions of the lamb, the portions to be prepared and eaten at the Passover, would be impaled on a stick and carried away on Peter and John's shoulders. The lamb had been slain. Now it was time to prepare it to be received. And what an absolutely perfect picture of Christ, the Lamb of God, being slain for us and prepared for everybody to receive. So we'll see the station of Christ, the symbolism of the past and the substance of the presence. But notice that number three, the seeking of one place and the finding of quite another. Look at Mark 14, verse 13 through 15. And he sendeth forth two of the disciples and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. Now the disciples of Jesus had asked, Lord, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover meal for all of us? And they'd either already gone to the temple and taken care of having the lamb slain and prepared, or they were on the way to the temple to do so, and then would go find the place after and just needed to know where to look. So Jesus told them to go into the city. Then he told them what to look for when they got there. But he did not give directions like we would assume. We would expect something like, go to 111 Judah Lane. Or, as we give directions around here, go down to Bojangles, turn right, go left, you get to the Wendy's, and we do all directions that way right here. But Jesus didn't give directions on either one of those ways. He just said, go into the city, a man's going to meet you, carrying a pitcher of water. You say, but... But there were millions of people in and around Jerusalem. How would they know which man carrying water was the one they were looking for? Let me show you a few verses of Scripture. I think you'll pretty quickly figure it out. Let's read them to you for time's sake. Listen carefully. Genesis 24, 11. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. 1 Samuel 9, 11. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. John 4, 7. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Please tell me, what is the common denominator in all those passages? They were all women. And all of them, it was the ladies who did the drawing and carrying of the water. Now please understand, this does not mean that men never drew or carried water. But it was the exception rather than the rule. If you saw a man carrying water, it was actually an unusual sight. It would take a great deal of humility for a man in those days to be willing to do that task. Now, I can't help but wonder about this man. Was his heart truly humble to the point of enjoying doing this task for whoever his master was? Or was he inwardly and even outwardly maybe complaining, why do I have to be the one to do such a menial job? Isn't there somebody else that can do that? One way or the other, without him even knowing what was coming that day, God had him doing that task in that place at a time for a far bigger reason than he could have ever imagined. 
That man, being willing to do a menial task, became the neon sign for the disciples to follow so that the Son of God could have a place to eat the Last Supper. Listen to me, on the days that you feel like the tasks of your life are menial and insignificant and meaningless, please remember that if you're doing what God wants you to do, there is no such thing as an insignificant task. If God wants you changing diapers today, then what you're doing is as important as the job of the man sitting in the Oval Office. If God wants you hauling off trash today, then what you're doing is as important as Gabriel carrying messages from heaven to earth. If God wants you ringing up somebody at the cash register today, then what you're doing is as important as Noah hammering on the ark. You see, God does not have threads. He has a tapestry of threads. He takes all the little strings of all of the lives of everyone who is being willing to use, be willing to be used by him and he weaves all those individual threads into a beautiful tapestry of his own will. This unknown, unnamed, humble gentleman doing an insignificant task was infinitely more important on that day than he ever could have thought he would be. So the apostles went into the city, ran into a man carrying water, followed him to a home, and then spoke to the master of the home. And that's when some amazing things happened. Look at verse 14 and 15 again. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. Now as you look at these verses, there's something so very obvious that falls into the category of amazing. Someone was willing to let Christ and his men have a room that was already furnished and prepared for use. And we'll cover that in a few minutes. But before we do, why don't we look at what most people usually miss that also falls under the category of amazing and all of this. Words mean things, especially the words of Scripture. And that's why we should never just gloss over them as we read them. We should never just see them as black words on a white page and skim over them like a newspaper. Jesus told his men to ask the master of the house, for a guest chamber that they could use to eat the Passover. Now through the years I would say that the majority of people you meet have just automatically assumed that the guest chamber he asked for was the upper room that he received. They were the same things. But that's not the case at all. The word for guest chamber is the word cataluma. It's the exact same word used in Luke chapter 2 when the Bible says there was no room for them in the inn. A cataluma, an inn, was a guest, or guest chambers, Mark calls it, was a hallway or an additional room added to the lower part of a house, something that would be rented out to others. It generally had very little privacy, and people had to go through it to get anywhere else in the house. So when Jesus told the men to ask for a guest chamber, he once again showed his humility. He didn't even come close to asking for the best thing that someone had available. Here's another really interesting paradox to consider. At the very beginning of his life, we read that there was no room for them in the inn, and therefore he condescended to being born in a manger, a stable for animals. Now here at the end of his life, he's once more being asked to be allowed into the inn, in the guest chamber, just a hallway or a little room added on. But whereas he was denied a place in the guest chamber as a babe, here in the last few hours of his life, he once again asks to be led into the inn, the guest chamber, and once again he's told no, but this time he's told no because the master of the house has something much better for him than that. As a babe, Joseph, his father, asked for a room in the inn and ended up in a stable. But here, just before Calvary, Peter and John asked for a room in the inn and instead are ushered into a large upper room. This man, whoever he was, bypassed the meager guest chamber that the Lord asked for and invited Christ instead into the choicest spot in his home. He gave Jesus the very best of the very best. Man, what a pattern for us to follow. In this day of shallow Christianity, when people relegate Christ to the role of insurance policy or spare tire or genie in a bottle to grant wishes, what we should be doing is giving him the preeminence in our hearts, the preeminence in our homes, the preeminence in our lives, the preeminence in our decisions. Don't you dare, don't you dare, don't you dare ever relegate Christ to a guest room in your life. You give him the large upper room, you give him the preeminence in all things. We see the station of Christ, the symbolism of the past, the substance of the presence, the seeking of one place and finding of another. 
but then notice number four, the setting of the table. Look at Mark 14, 15, and 16 again. Mark 14, 15 says, And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And the disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he'd said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Jesus told his disciples to go into the city. He said, you'll meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow that man. Wherever he goes, go in and speak to the good man of the house. Ask for a guest chamber. Well, they did so, and the man shockingly led them to a large upper room instead. But even that still wasn't the end of the story. This large upper room was prepared and furnished. Those words tell us, that the table and the low-slung couches were in place, and that everything except the lamb itself was already ready. In other words, someone had gone to great lengths to prepare a meal and a place before he ever knew why or for whom. Let this sink in. We just came through Christmas. Can you imagine you come home one day, you find the head of your home laying out, putting up tables and setting up chairs and laying this huge, gigantic meal out, and you know none of your family's scheduled to come over that day, and you say, what are you doing? I'm setting up tables and chairs and putting a meal out. For who? I ain't got a clue. You'd say, have you lost your mind? Can you imagine what the servant must have thought when he saw the good one of the house laying all this out? Can you imagine what the family must have thought when they saw the good one of the house laying all this out? You talk about being led by the Holy Spirit of God. This man had everything ready for Jesus and his men without ever even being told they were coming. And yet, because of what he did, Jesus and his disciples, his dearest friends, had a place to eat one last meal before he went to the cross, and not just any meal, the Passover meal. When Christ arrived in town, everything was already furnished and prepared for him, even though he hadn't told the, men he, the man he was coming. You letting that one sink in? Folks, this is very simply exactly what Christ expects of us every single day. He's coming again, and he expects us all day, every day, to be furnished and prepared, ready for his coming. When he comes, there won't be any time for rushing around and getting ready. We'll either be prepared or we won't. So my question is, are you prepared should he come tonight.